Okay, so when you come in, I'll have you check my audio. Is that you? Oh, people are coming in. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Jessica Bastian from Illinois Central College. I'm part of the uh, Forward Focus Conference team. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, you're trying to unmute me. Good morning. Can anyone hear me? No. Oh, okay.
Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Hoping yes. Okay. Yes, great. My name is Jessica Bastian, and I'm the Digital Services Librarian here at Illinois Central College. I'm also part of the Forward Focus planning team, and we're so excited to be here with you this morning. So welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Um, while I'm kind of doing my little introduction, I was hoping that we could go ahead and in the chat, if we could type where you're from, um, what your, the name of your community college, and then what part of the, um, the country you're from, so what state you're in, um, so we can get a sense of, of where we're all um, coming from. So uh, this year's conference theme is the voice of the student. So the voice of the student echoes into every corner of community college librarianship, but how do we make sure that we're really listening, right? That's the, the fundamental question. Um, so today, we're gonna hear from several presenters. Um, um, we're gonna hear how our presenters serve the needs of their students, and I'm so excited um, to get started. So our first presenter this morning is Jill Stott from Mott Community College, and her presentation is titled More Than Books, Developing a Library of Things for a Community College. And just so that we stay on time, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill, and I hope I didn't completely butcher your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll turn it over to Jill, and um, yeah, great, we'll have a, um, thank you. Okay, great. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my, screen and let's go ahead and get this up here. Eh, nope, I didn't want to do that. Okay. All right, so can everybody see this? <laughs> okay. All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, my name is actually Jill So, <laughs> so not too bad, but, and hopefully everybody can hear me fine. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the library of things that we developed here at Mott Community College. So let's just dive right in. Um, but first I wanted to cover a little bit about the history of libraries of things. Um, and this is really part of the sharing economy. So share collections really have been around for centuries and things like farming equipment and tools were often shared within a community with a common um, storage space. Around the early 1900s, things like shared toy collections became a lot more common. Museums have often had art collections that can be borrowed. Our local art museum here in Flint actually does have paintings. They have a collection that you can go in and borrow in that way. Um, and it's much like books in a library. So you go and you check them out for a period of time. Um, of course, loan periods tend to be a lot longer because people like to have the art in their homes for longer periods of time. But really the overarching ideal of a sharing economy doesn't always translate well into the marketplace if you're looking to make a profit off it. But it does lend itself really well to libraries because we don't like, we're not looking to make a profit off the items that we are lending to the public. So it was difficult really to pinpoint an exact date or even a decade when Library of Things movement started. Um, but it's really, I think, from what I could tell from the literature, it's gathered momentum probably in the last two decades with a lot more libraries um, collecting things, advertising it, and probably really first calling it a Library of Things. So chances are that it's a lot older than that. But as far as really becoming in, in popularity and more and more libraries actually joining in, um, it's, it's really been probably in the past 20 years or so. So with trends, 20, around 2016, um, EBSCO did a customer survey of public libraries just to find out what they were collecting, um, kind of what they were finding with their own library of things that they had. So 20% of the libraries that responded who actually had a collection, they had board games. So it was a lot of the common board games that you would see, like the family games, like Sorry, Monopoly, Clue, those sorts of things. But they also found that there were libraries that were collecting more adult type games, um, like Settlers of Catan and King of Tokyo, so more sophisticated games as well that 
were maybe not quite as common. Um, other libraries, 43% offered museum passes. So almost half of the libraries were offering something like that as part of their Library of Things collection. 24% um, obviously were offering recreational or exercise equipment. So the, this could be things, I mean, as big as like a kayak or something as simple as lawn games. But so these were fairly common things as well that people could actually check out. But then there were a lot of unusual things too that were more specific to the libraries or the communities they served. So one library, they had a library cat and they were actually checking out grooming supplies for the cat. So you could check out a brush and you could go brush the cat. Um, so it really depends a lot. Really what we found is much like libraries do with just their general print collections is they were collecting for what their communities needed. So there's another library that is um, talked about in this report and they have a very uh, large aging population in their community and so one of the things that they did is they put together kits that could be taken then into either retirement centers or um, nursing homes places like that and used with residents in those facilities and so librarians of course doing what we do have been developing different things that actually meet their community needs. All right. So I actually the librarian who wanted to start a library of things here really did a lot of research and thought about why should we do one here. And we thought about this and we said really our students deserve more. Um, even more than what we could just offer with the book collections and our electronic resources here at the library um, and any of our other services that we had on campus. So to give you some background for Genesee County, um, the poverty rate here is 38.9%. Um, and this is according to a survey that was done in 2017. So this is really current information. 27.7% um, of the adults in Genesee County don't engage in any sort of physical activities in their leisure time. And this was all published just recently, just this year in a community health needs assessment report. So our students don't necessarily have access to a lot of different, whether it's um, leisure, you know, activities, um, they don't have access to even just like basic, you know, if they want to do home improvement type of things, they don't have access to a lot of those things because they don't have the money or the resources. And so we wanted to be able to provide more access basically for our students to do things and to experience new things and explore stuff that maybe they haven't really thought about or they've wanted to try, but they just don't they just don't have the ability to do so for whatever reason it is. So a library of things really made a lot of sense for us. And, you know, and then beyond that too, we are community college. So, you know, being a commuter campus, a lot of our students are here for the day. Um, and we wanted to offer some options as well with things like board games that, you know, they could check out while they're on campus, they could play with their friends. Um, and then, you know, they could return it if they wanted to. Of course, they can be checked out and taken home as well. And then we had some things too that, you know, we know that there's things that students might need just for academic reasons um, that, you know, they're never going to need again. And so we thought, well, that's a good way we can provide those things too, because they're just simply maybe too expensive. So again, it's the whole sharing economy um, idea behind this. But we really just wanted to expand the type of services that we could provide our students. And so we went ahead and wrote a grant. So my librarian who actually put the grant together, um, she did some research. She looked at how much we would actually probably need to get started, did some pricing. You know, it's always hard to tell because you don't really know how much everything's gonna cost up front. Um, what our college president had started uh, about ooh, five years ago now almost, almost from the from the day she walked in the door are these mini grants that she gives out and staff can write a mini grant request up to five thousand dollars and so that's that's what we requested for this and um, you know she went and she did her research and looked at what type of items might we want she had a big long list of 
basically just a wish list. And that didn't all go into the mini grant. She had some good examples and really explained what it was that we were wanting to do with this, what the purpose would be, what our outcomes were. I mean, all the type of things that you would want to put into a grant request, basically. Um, wasn't these grants aren't quite as involved as like if you were going out and doing you know something more formal for the government or something like that um but you know it's still good experience for people to get for grant writing so and it's a good way for us to get some extra money in our budget that we don't normally have um and anyway so we wrote that in october 2018 and i do have to um, sign off on any of those that my staff write so um, and i did a little tweaking just to make sure that it looked really good because this was something I really was pretty excited about too and I wanted to make sure that we got the approval for it um, and so we did and we got our funds then in November of 2018 so about a year ago um, and then we really sat down and this is something that I worked on with her and we went through the list we talked about you know what types of things we could afford we looked at you know okay we've got five thousand dollars which sounds like a lot but once you start spending money it's not quite as much as you really think it is and we've kind of figured out what were our priorities so that was the biggest thing in November once we had the money was sitting down with this list and prioritizing what did we think we needed first so we looked at really academic needs first um, we looked at okay what are some of the leisure type items that we wanted to get next and then you know maybe some other just interesting things so that was how we really looked at that initial thing and then it was time to start shopping so we got we also did get some input from our library staff we talked to our student workers here in the library about things that they might like to actually see um, and then we reached out to some specific faculty as well we knew that there were some areas where we were needing maybe to target to have items that were available here in the library um, for specific classes that would really benefit the students when they were in here studying we see a lot of nursing students, um, health sciences in particular, utilize our study rooms. And so we wanted to see if there were items that they might actually need that would help them when they're coming over for study sessions. And so, um, and then some of our anatomy and physiology faculty as well with some of the, the science classes. And so we reached out to them to talk about, you know, what types of things would we need um, and then what would they recommend in terms of what we should get so kind of some back and forth the skeleton on my opening slide is actually a photo of the actual skeleton that we have and it's not a full size um, that's kind of a pie in the sky because those are expensive <laughs> to get and unfortunately they didn't have one they could spare for us we were really hoping they would just give us one for the library of things um, but we did end up getting like a smaller skeleton which is which is checked out um he's actually injured right now so he's he's in the back um waiting to get fixed so we might just have to put his arm in the sling i think it's like his wrist that's broken um but that was kind of one of the things we knew that they needed um an anatomical like model so they could identify muscles and inner organs and all those sorts of things so that that helped us with some of those things um you know and that was that was helpful but with talking to faculty and what types of things and the students actually are using those um graphing calculators were another big thing that um we found that they really were going to use and i think initially we were only going to buy a couple we ended up buying I want to say we've got four four to six in our count on our in our collection right now and those are getting checked out quite a bit too and uh, we actually share those a lot of times with our testing center which is on the third floor of the library um, because students go up there and they need them and so that's ended up being a collaboration that kind of spun out of this um, so there's a lot of things that kind of went into this and so we spent many months actually purchasing we did a lot of research into looking at reviews for you know equipment and the things that we were purchasing we wanted to get as good of you know as good of things as we could get with our money and spend as well as we could 
we really had initially hoped that we would do a lot more local shopping. We did a lot of our buying through Amazon. Um, the college does have business accounts um, with them, and so we saved on shipping and those types of things. And that wasn't initially really the way we wanted to do it, but we just didn't have the local stores to do that either. And so that was kind of unfortunate and not quite the direction we were hoping for when we started. But, you know, again, it was, we had $5,000. We wanted to stretch our dollars as far as we could go um, to help the students. And we just, you know, at that point just didn't have what we needed. Since then, we've had actually a local game store open up in Flint. And I think if we look for buying any more board games and those types of things, we'd reach out to them to purchase anything new for the collection. Um, and so, you know, there's some things for going forward that we will take into consideration. Um, but yeah, Amazon kind of ended up being our, our go-to for the most part. Um, and that, and it did work out pretty well for us. I think we had, we had a couple snags with a few weird things, but um, all right. So some of the themes that we really were, again, we were looking at were academic support was really big for us. Um, we wanted to make sure that really this was probably our primary um, focus. So if, if that was the only thing that we could have spent money on, then that was where it was going to go. So if we could support academic programs in any particular way, because that's really what we exist for as a library as well. Um, so again, Skeleton came in with that. The um, I think we call her Gutsy Gertie is actually the anatomical model that we have, um, the calculators, and there's some other things. We actually um, purchased a die cut machine. It's an Ellison machine. And really the main goal for that is to support, we have an early childhood program. And so we know that, you know, at some point the students will want to make things because they, they usually have to do some sort of presentation. It tends to be in our winter semester and they, do these presentation boards and things like that. And so this will be really helpful for them to be able to come and use the die cuts for that. And so, you know, we thought that's another kind of academic support thing as well for, for those students. And I kind of look forward to seeing what other dies they would like us to buy with that. Um, we've bought just kind of some basic, some um, like shapes and flowers and, you know, things like that, that would be helpful for them when they're doing anything with children. So um, uh, let's see. And then we look next at like personal development enrichment. So what are things that people might want to learn something new? So the ukulele actually has been huge in this one. Um, people have really been checking that out. And uh, we also got like a guitar, a keyboard. Um, those sorts of things. So if somebody wants to learn a new skill. And we also made sure that when we got those, we got tuners with them. So we have like the little snark tuners that can be put on the um, guitars. So people, you know, of course, they need to be able to tune the, the instruments when they're doing that. We did purchase um, beginner books as well, but we don't include those in our library things. Those are just actually in our library collection. So we kind of did some debating back and forth. It's like, should we include it with the actual instruments or should we just put it in the collection? We figured, well, if people knew how to play already, then they could just go ahead and, you know, do whatever they needed to do. If they didn't know how to play, we'd let them know somehow. And a lot of times it even says like in the library if, on the actual item that there are uh, books and things like that available. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really kind of up to the individual if they want to go out and find YouTube videos or whatever. Um, there's a lot of other options out there. So, but we, we chose not to do it that way. And if some libraries do kind of put everything together into a bundle, but we, we did not. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of what we did with those things. And then, um, then we have like really what we call more of our leisure thing. Um, and those are, you know, again, the board games. We've got some long games that we bought. We have a hammock um, that people can check out and just a lot of the other fun things. So um, 
that's pretty much what we looked at for those sorts of things. I also say with the personal development or enrichment, we do have like tools. We also got a bike repair kit. Um, we had just got um, like the bike rental rack on campus. And so hopefully biking is going to take off. It's really actually very big in Genesee County. We have a lot of bike trails that connect throughout the county. Um, and so, you know, we thought, well, that would actually be something really nice if people start taking up taking that up more. And we do have some people that do bike on campus. Um, not our students quite as much, but we're hoping, you know, that as they become more aware that this will be something that will be handy. And it might not even be something that gets checked out that often, but even if somebody just needed a, to do a quick repair, they don't have a kit with them, um, it's something that they can come check out here too. Because again, these items, even though we really were focusing on students, they can be checked out by anybody who is associated with a college. So that's also a nice thing. So some of the other things that we had to really think about <laughs> um, as we got going, Oh, that should say loan periods, um, was loan periods though. So we knew that some things we wanted to allow for just like, like our regular checkout period of three weeks, just like our books. Uh, then there were other things we thought, well, they probably don't need it that long. Um, and so there were things that just had different periods of time. There are some things that are really just truly only in library use, only because purely because of their size or because of just kind of what the item is, like our skeleton doesn't get checked out of the library that has to be used within the library, partly because it's fragile. It's just, it's very hard to move. We don't have a way to pack it into anything so that it could be taken elsewhere. Um, so there's some things like that. And so it was kind of neg negotiating all of that, um, figuring out how to do that, which then of course with our circulation system, having to set all that up, we're part of consortiums. So we had to work with our consortial people and you know, deciding and then setting up circ maps and all of those kind of back end sorts of things. So that took some time to get all of that done as well. So while we were doing some of the purchasing and finishing all of that up, we were also working on this stuff as well. Storage was a big, big thing um, because we don't have a lot of storage space. And in, just in general, we just don't have storage space in the library. And we didn't really know okay, where we wanted to do this. So we have a little bit of room off um, where our circulation desk is, but that's actually a lot for our student workers as well. It's where their time clock is. They have lockers back in that area. And there's a table back there and we debated some. We're like, well, we could put some shelves in there, but there really wasn't a lot of space back there and it would make it even tighter. And there's, just, there's other just weird features in that room. So we thought, well, you know, it would be nice to have it where it's more on display and people would actually ask about it. But there isn't a lot of usable space behind our circulation area that really isn't already being used for something else, whether it's, you know, in our library loan shelves or revising shelves for, you know, books waiting to go back out in the library and all those types of things and our circulation staff desks and all, you know, it's, it's used space. So we finally figured out uh, after <laughs> a lot of debate about what should we do? Should we have a cabinet? Should we have open shelves? What do we need? We do have open shelves back there. Um, we put them on the back wall. I think we had to move the desks up a little bit, but we still had enough clearance because that's another thing too is, is there enough room for everybody to move around that needs to be back there and there's a lot of movement behind our circulation desk, I realized as we were working on this. Um, and uh, it's a fairly tall shelf and our facilities worked with us on this one and it's it's connected to the wall so the shelf's not going to fall over which is good and so pretty much everything is up on that shelf for right now and there is space that if we need to put another unit in as the library things grows we would be able to do that um, and then one of the other staff actually designed a really nice library of things sign that's hung up above that now and so it's very obvious what's on those shelves and everything's kind of arranged so like the board games are up higher so you can see those and it's it's actually very eye-catching and appealing looking so I think it's that is catching some interest as well because people see it and they're like what, what is that about um, and then even some of the items themselves was how to store it because we couldn't just set them on the shelf um, just for fear that, you know, they'd get crushed or uh, 
you know, they're just small items or awkward items. So we had a lot of like, okay, how do we, what kind of box do we put this in? And if it's in a box, you know, it needs to be maybe padded. And so there's a lot of looking through catalogs of finding the foam that would work. And what, what my librarian actually, who had worked on this the most found was some foam where you could take parts of it out. So it was kind of more like in squares and you could, you know, and there were different configurations and different sizes of the squares. And that actually worked best because then, you know, we could basically make it fit whatever the item happened to be. So we have things like air quality monitors, a, um, oh, like an energy meter type thing. And so those things are in boxes, but this foam works really well for it because they need to kind of be protected somewhat and they get checked out in the containers. So, because we want them to be protected, we don't want somebody just kind of like throwing it wherever and the thing getting, you know, mangled <laughs> in the process. So, and plus it makes it easier for us to put barcodes on things and tag it and whatever, because a lot of things are barcoded on a luggage tag. So that helps, but it was, it was a, a little bit of a process kind of figuring out how are we going to do all this and how do we label this stuff and, you know, because some things are too small to label in that regard. So that was the solution that we came up with and so far it seems to be working really well. A lot of things like um, the instruments, we actually purchased those with cases. So that we did in, intentionally so that they actually did have a case either it was part of the package or we bought the case to go along with it um, so that those things, you know, that just became part of the deal. And that made that much easier for that as well. And then the luggage tag with the barcode and any information that we needed, could, you know, is put on that. And um, so that works out really well for us so far. Of course, we'll, we'll see how some of that wears within, you know, a couple years or so. Um, but for now, it does seem to be working really well. And of course, luggage tags for us, you know, we're like, they're cheap. It's not a big deal if we need to replace them for, you know, a couple bucks, it's not a big deal. Um, and we also have a lamination machine. If, if, you know, we find out this is just not working quite as well, we have some other options that we can try, so. Then we looked at policy and we really didn't reinvent the wheel on this one. We took pieces from other libraries. One of the libraries I found up here that had just really, really solid policies and even a user agreement was Capital Area District Libraries. And they have, uh, they just have an outstanding library of things themselves. And they've been doing this for a while. So uh, I took a lot of pieces from theirs and there were a few things that I could leave off because we're not a public library. So there were some things I didn't really necessarily need to worry about. And there were, I think, a couple things I needed to put in because we are an academic library. So just a few little tweaks and that worked for me. So um, that was basically our policy. And we ran it by everybody here on staff just to make sure we worked pretty closely with circulation staff to make sure that anything that we were doing was going to work for them too. Because even though um, the librarian who wrote the grant, she's our acquisitions and cataloging librarian, but our circ staff are the people really who are gonna be dealing with the library of things the most, because they're gonna be checking it out you know, all the items out, they're going to be the ones that are going to be evaluating for any damage when they come back or any lost pieces or those sorts of things. So they needed to be part of the process um, as we were doing things like policy and storage and anything like that. So, um, and then we went ahead then and worked on the user agreement. And this is probably the thing that took the longest um, as far as the paperwork portion of it. And these are the things that I worked on the most. Um, and again, like I said, I, I really pulled from what Capital Area District Library had. Um, and we wanted to make sure it was just a one page user agreement. I think some of the others that I had seen in other libraries were two, two pages at least, but we wanted a carbon type of um, user agreement so that we kept a copy, the user, the patron gets a copy. Um, so really had to kind of tighten up language and really think about what it needed to be in there. So that, that really did take some working on it. Um, but a lot of the point with the user agreements, you know, if we were just lending out board games, I wouldn't be too worried about it. But we lend things, you know, that 
I guess potentially, I don't think they could be that dangerous to people, but if somebody should do something silly with it, we don't want to be responsible for it because once it leaves the library, it's really up to the person using it to use it correctly. Um, and we want to make sure people understand that if they damage something, they're responsible for it. So, you know, we expect these items to come back, um, you know, really in the condition that they left outside of normal wear and tear. You know, we know things are going to eventually wear out because it, they do. But, and, you know, and within reason too. We know sometimes game pieces get lost. They just do. <laughs> um, you know, I was saying for an example, I've got a large dog with a very large fluffy tail and sometimes her tail will catch things and who knows where they go. Um, and we get that and we understand that. And, you know, we fully are aware that there are times with like the games we may not get all the pieces back and it's not because somebody was being malicious with it and we probably will not charge them for the full replacement cost of a game. And we'll just use that game with the lost piece for replacement pieces for the future and just buy a replacement, um, not charge the patron for it. But it's, you know, it's the stuff where like somebody runs over, you know, the, the ukulele with their car. Um, yeah, they're going to have to replace that. <laughs> so we want to make sure that people understand that up front. Um, so the patron does get a copy. Each time somebody checks something out for library things, they do have to sign a new user agreement. But we include the information on there, like the item that they're checking out that actually goes on the user agreement. So uh, they know <laughs> what, they're, what they have checked out in case they find the agreement and they can't find the item. Um, and we put the, the date due on there too. So they know whatever they've checked out if, because we don't actually have a receipt printer. Um, so this actually is where they can keep track of when they need to bring that item back. So we wanted to make sure that there was a way to do that because although we have went fine free on our books, our library of things, we do charge fines if things do not come back. So that is one of the things with that. So, and then our soft launch for the library was in June of 2019. And I say soft launch really because we really weren't advertising it big at that point. We talked, I think we might have done a little bit of advertising on our Facebook page, a um, little bit kind of within the library that it was actually available. The very first thing that checked out was the sewing machine, interestingly enough. Uh, and this is the exact model that we have. Um, but we don't have a lot of students on campus in the summertime and pretty much once July hits here, it's a ghost town. So we really weren't gonna put a lot of effort into advertising it in any sort of you know really big way because nobody would have noticed it. Um, in general. So it, it was just very much like, okay, we're here. It's sort of here, you know, and so people could try it. And we wanted to see too, are there any kind of like weird things we need to be aware of? How's, how's all, you know, the circulation stuff working? Is our storage stuff working? Are there any options, anything that we really just haven't thought about? Um, and then our formal launch was in September 2019. Our college had a big event called Departments on the Lawn, and we participated in that. And I was looking through my pictures and I didn't take a picture of our table. Instead, I took a picture of my staff playing cornhole, which is actually one of the games in our library of things. And you can see in the background in the tree, that's actually our hammock. Um, and they put that up. And then we had a bunch of our other items on our table. And it was so funny to see students' reactions because we have a tablecloth that says Mott Library on it. And students would see the tablecloth and they'd look at the table <laughs> and there would be this complete disconnect on their face because there were no books on our table. There were just all these weird items like a ukulele and um, I'm trying to think what else we had out there we had some games and I think we had some of the meters and the um, uh, calculator. And so <laughs> they'd stop and they'd, uh, and they'd be like, this is a library? And we're like, yeah, we're the library. And we have more than books. 
So it was a really good conversation starter for us um, about, you know, we have more than just books and then talking a little bit about our spaces. And so that worked out really well for us and generated a lot, a lot of interest. Um, the ukulele was just a huge hit that day and a lot of people wanted to play it and, and just we had a lot of interest in it. And I think actually that might've been the first thing that got checked out right after we went back to the library after the event that afternoon. So um, it was a good, yeah, it was a good event. Uh, so now we're looking at the future and what's next for us. We are working on a LibGuide to go with the library of things and some of the things that we do plan to include with that, of course, a lot of our items do have um, user manuals that go with them, and those are included with the, the, the actual items as well. But we do plan to put those into a LibGuide as well. Um, we'll be doing some links to various YouTube videos, so there's a lot of vetting that we're doing within that to find good YouTube videos um, for things, you know, whether it's like ukulele, um, instruction videos or guitar instruction videos or other things like that. Um, so we'll be putting those things in there as well as links to if we have books in our collection that are related um, to the items themselves or if we have actually bought specific books for um, the items as well. Then uh, Capital Area District Library um, has proposed putting together a statewide map of library things locations. So all the libraries within the state of Michigan that actually have a collection of some sort um, would be able to include themselves on this. So that would be something that we would definitely want to participate in. And there's a lot of libraries within the state of Michigan. So I very much look, <clears throat> look forward to being able to include ourselves in that. So whenever that actually happens, um, and I'm sure that they will make sure that does happen, um, but that was something that came out on our statewide library listserv well, a couple months ago. And then another thing that we have talked about are themed kits. And again, we didn't really do anything like that yet, but I think one of the first ones that we've talked some about doing is a bird watching kit. So we would put, you know, binoculars and possibly we would get, you know, like a bird identification book. So that would be one that we would include the book in the kit. Um, I'm not sure what else we would put in there with it, but we're thinking, you know, things that people could take out into, you know, a park or wherever. And we have a nature preserve right in within our, um, almost within kind of like city limits. Uh, it's actually within our township, but it's called Formar. And, you know, that's something people could take, they could take with their family um, and then go there and, you know, look for birds <laughs> or whatever. Um, so that's a possibility of doing some things like that. I don't know what other ones that we might um, look at, but we have a lot of different kind of outside activities within Genesee County that I think we'd like to encourage people to explore. And we have a lot of students and well, and you know, of course, staff and faculty as well who have family, um, they have children. And so things that people could share with their families is really kind of the idea too. Uh, and then we'd like to, you know, really talk more with students to add items based on what they would like to see or things that they need. Um, we've just started a student advisory committee, and we had our first meeting actually yesterday morning. And that's one thing I'll be looking for feedback from them to see what what are they interested in having. You know, what are some things that they might enjoy using, but they don't necessarily want to own, um, just because they wouldn't use it that often. But, or some things that, you know, it might be kind of fun to have on campus, but they don't you know, necessarily want to use it all the time or something that, you know, they've just never thought about and they might like to try. So we'll be, we'll be seeking some more feedback in those regards as well. And then we want to do more advertising. And that's the biggest thing is really getting the word out to more and more people. And that was one thing too, meeting with the students um, for the advice on our advisory uh, council was they had some really good ideas about how we could do some advertising and so I'm going to be exploring some of that as well in the future. And let's see and then this is just a list of our things so we have a lot of different things. Really pretty pretty excited about it. I 
I have a feeling our happy touch light will start circulating very soon as our Michigan <laughs> winter starts in December and and that's all I have for today. So thank you. Well, great. Thank you, Jill. That was really interesting. Um, throughout the presentation, there were several questions that came up. So we're going to go ahead and re we're going to, Jim's going to reload them in chat. And okay. um, Jill, if you would please yes. address some of those questions. All right. Um, let's see here. So, um, well, we can take this one that came up kind of recently. So along with the sewing machine, do you supply thread, et cetera, or um, just simply the machine itself? We just supply the machine. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. And then the only two other ones that I don't think we've already addressed is how do you catalog the items? Any best practices? Um, I think you did address this. Do you, did you attach barcodes to everything? Mm -hmm. uh, the cataloging, <laughs> I probably can't speak to that quite as much. I would refer you to um, our cataloger, uh, the, who did most of the work on that. Um, I think a lot of it is really fairly brief records as far as our catalogs go. Um, and oh, we set, we already had, um, I think equipment as an item type within our catalog. And so I think that's something that we use more for the library of things there. Yeah, there was, <laughs> it got kind of difficult of, we did a lot of, I think, discussion about how should we do this? How would it work the best in the catalog? Um, so I, yeah, I would refer you to her to talk a little, to talk more about that. Um, and yeah, if you want to even just shoot me an email and I can get you her, get you connected with her. Um, yes, everything though is barcoded separately. So if we couldn't put a barcode on it easily, there is like a tag somewhere on the container that it's in or the bar, the item, or the container itself is barcoded. So yeah, so we managed to barcode everything in some way. Okay. Um, yep. Great. And mm -hmm. and Jill, one other thing that came up in the chat was um, a desire to see maybe pictures of your space, especially in regards to how you store items. Would you be willing to provide some pictures and we could send sure. it out afterwards? Yeah, I could do that. Okay, great. And um, I did mention in the chat, but we'll send out, Forward Focus will send out a LibGuide, there's a conference recap um, with the recordings and so on. And so if any other institution wants to share their own policies in regards to libraries of things or their mm -hmm. own pictures, I'd be happy to include all of that and, sh and share it widely. So, and I put my email address in the chat if anyone would like to send me anything. Okay. Um, oh, and I see a question with the oh. scientific calculators. Yes. Uh, I haven't heard of any problems. So everybody, they, I mean, nothing that has been reported. They seem to be working fine. Okay, great. Um, and have you run into anyone, this is kind of just even, oh, do you supply batteries with the calculators? Yes, we would. I mean, it, I don't think they've run out yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, anything that, that would be something like that, if we have an item that, you know, does require batteries if it needed that, we would replace those. Um, but yeah, if it's something like with the sewing machine, if somebody did need like thread, bobbins, those types of things, we do, we pretty much recommend they use what the manufacturer recommends for it. Um, but we, yeah, we won't provide those sorts of things just because we, we have no idea what people might actually need. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like the die cut machine, we're not going to provide their paper. Um, they would have to provide the appropriate paper for it, but the cutting mats and those sorts of things and any adapters that might be needed for the dies, um, we will provide those. And of course, if somebody wants to come in with their own dies, as long as they fit in the machine, they're more than welcome to use that. Um, although probably most people aren't going to come in with their own, but it, you know, it could happen. Okay. Um, and then just there was one more question. Um, she says, maybe, Tammy says, maybe this was answered, but do you have staff count pieces in items upon return? We have student workers, so yes, they would have to do that. Um, and I'm trying to think, 
most of the games I don't think are too bad so far. So <laughs> I hate to think if we get anything that's worse and we don't check out like puzzles or anything, fortunately. So, um, but yes, they, they are supposed to be checking to make sure everything is, is coming back. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> puzzles. We have puzzles that, that are just out in the library. I think if we ever do anything with puzzles, it will be more of just like a puzzle exchange and we'll just let people do what they want. <laughs> okay, well, if there are no more questions, uh, Jill, thank you so much. It was really um, such an interesting talk and, and great work. Um, we, yes, um, that was really <laughs> You're welcome. great. And um, like I said, we'll send out the recording and any um, policies, pictures, or anything that's shared with Forward Focus, we'll put that on the LibGuide and you can expect that early next week. Um, if you're sticking around for the other sessions, you do have to exit this room and use the link that was sent to you for the 1030 session, which will start at 1030. So thank you, everyone. And uh, Jill, thanks again so much. Okay, great. Thank you.